here. Be close like that. Be sure to open. James Cadigan interviewing Mr. Harry P. France for the Living Legends of Oklahoma. We are today on May the 20th, 1970, interviewing Mr. France in the First Methodist Church in the city of Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, Mr. France, uh, tell us about your uh, place of birth and parents, uh, something of your background before arriving at Enid. I was born at uh, Wellington, Kansas, just across the line north in 1894 and uh, lived there and uh, till 1900 on uh, which uh, date uh, my father uh, moved a lumberyard office on a flat car from Wellington, Kansas to the site of Enid, Oklahoma. He did not make the run, but his brother did, and uh, they decided that Enid was uh, going to be a wonderful place to uh, live and raise a family, and uh, therefore they uh, both moved here and started in business in uh, Enid uh, in 1900. Uh, Mr. France, can you remember any special events which occurred in your early boyhood, tell us the approximate years if you can remember. Well, there's nothing uh, in particular uh, that I know of that would be of historical value. A lot of things happened as a child here, of course, uh, which uh, might be of interest to some close friends, but uh, not historically. Um, my father bought a quarter of a block of ground uh, where the uh, Central National Bank and Oklahoma Natural Gas and Washington Square are now located. He bought the quarter of a ground for $500 and started a lumber yard there and was in the lumber business for many years here. Uh, he might uh, have uh, been in the lumber business for longer than that had it not been for the fact that there was about 11 yum lumber yards in Enid at the time he sold and uh, they decided there was too many for them to make any money so uh, six of them put their uh, uh, name in the hat and they drew out I mean put all their names in the hat and six of them were drawn out which Six were to quit business and agreed to sell out to the others. He later, uh, uh, he and his brother Edmund France bought the uh, newspaper here, the Enid Daily Eagle. And uh, being two uh, Democrats running a Republican paper, they decided that wasn't the best thing to do. So eventually they sold uh, the paper to M.C. Garber, who had the Enid Morning News. Uh, Bill Taylor, who uh, was working for them at the time and also came from Wellington, Kansas, uh, uh, was manager of the Eagle. And uh, they sold to Garber 50% uh, uh, and bought 50% of the Enid Morning News and carried Taylor for it uh, until such time as he paid them out, which uh, was only a short time as uh, they had a monopoly and they made so much money in those days that they paid him out in about three years. Uh, 
The uh, France family and Enid uh, were very instrumental in building this town, particularly Edmund France. There was uh, Edmund France and Mont France and Frank France and Orville France and my father W. D. France, Will France. They uh, they started a hardware store here, Lumberyard, built the old France Hotel, and uh, were very instrumental in uh, building and improving uh, and making a town or city out of Enid. I will recall that uh, originally the Rock Island Railroad here uh, intended that uh, North Enid should be the uh, town site. And uh, some of their uh, stockholders and officers came in and uh, located the town site at North Enid and bought up all the property along the track. Well, the uh, uh, people of Enid, who were settled south of there about a mile, decided that uh, they hadn't been treated exactly right, so they uh, all moved down there and established uh, that as Enid. The Rock Island uh, refused to stop their trains in Enid and tried to force them to move up to North Enid, but they refused to do it, and uh, they used some of the methods that are being used nowadays to force them to uh, concede to their wishes by blowing up the track uh, in different places and putting a note up to stop at Enid until finally the Rock Island decided there was nothing else to do. So they then began stopping their trains at Enid. Edmund France, uh, my father's brother, was instrumental in bringing other several lines into Enid, the old D, E, and G Railroad the one which ran uh, east up through Guthrie. And um, as I recall, the town Douglas, Oklahoma, was named after his son, Douglas France. In about uh, 1907, uh, Frank France, my father's brother, was uh, appointed uh, territorial governor of Oklahoma. He had been in Teddy Roosevelt's uh, Rough Riders and uh, distinguished himself in the field and having had an appointment as captain on the field. Uh, Roosevelt uh, when Oklahoma was uh, uh, chartered, uh, appointed Frank France as the last territorial governor. And I will recall that Enid uh, took a special train to the inauguration in Guthrie. And um, Douglas France, Edmund's son, and I, who were only about uh, 13 or 14 years old at the time, rode on the engine over to Guthrie to attend the inauguration. However, uh, about that time, we were very much interested in badge collecting, which seemed to be the fad of a lot of children in those days. And we spent all day downtown in Guthrie buying badges and never did get to the inauguration. Later, uh, Frank France uh, ran for uh, governor of, of Oklahoma and was defeated by Haskell by a small margin of votes. who was a uh, registered uh, Democrat. I attended schools in uh, Enid, Oklahoma all my life and later on went to Oklahoma University where I graduated in law in 1917. The latter part of 1917, uh, beginning the First World War, I tried to get in the uh, army in, at the university, but they weren't taking anybody but 
graduate students, so I hopped a freight train along with two or three of my friends, and we went up to uh, um, Punk City and enlisted there in the first officer's training camp and went to Fort Logan H. Roots, where I took my training and graduating as a first lieutenant. Mr. Prance, uh, can you describe or tell us about those who were the community leaders while you were growing up? Oh, I can remember uh, a lot of them, some of them anyway, uh, most of uh, whom are dead at the present time. I remember that M.C. Garber was uh, very instrumental in building Enid. And Vic Messel, who in the early days uh, was one of our mayors, as well as a uh, uh, saloon owner and operator. And um, W.J. Uh, Ottson, who is uh, an attorney and still living, by the way, and still active. And uh, there was W.O. Crummel in the early days, whose son Lee is, still lives here and uh, runs the Crummel Press. And, of course, H.H. H. Uh, Champlin, uh, who... Uh, was in the oil business here and uh, later uh, built and developed the Champlin Oil and Refining Company. Wheat uh, in Garfield County, uh, of course, is our uh, main product. Uh, in the early days, I can recall that Enid used to be the biggest poultry and egg center in the world. All of the big poultry houses uh, operated here, and every farmer, uh, in addition to his wheat, raised chickens and uh, sold eggs and raised a few cows, milked a few cows, and sold cream and uh, to the... Um, uh, dairies and uh, wheat was just uh, an extra profit. They all raised enough uh, vegetables and garden stuff and uh, milked enough cows and uh, sold enough poultry and eggs to keep them and wheat was just uh, an extra profit. But all that has now uh, gone by the wayside. Farmers are all uh, gone, most of them. Farms have been sold to a very few people. They don't raise any chickens or eggs anymore, and the poultry uh, places have all moved away. And uh, Enid is no longer a poultry and egg center of Mr. Prance, uh, give us some of the details of your earliest job experience. What the machinery and other working conditions of at that time? Well, uh, when I got out of the First World War and came back to Enid, uh, as I said before, I. Uh, uh, was married in the meantime and had one child and felt that I, I couldn't afford to hang out my shingles and uh, struggled through starting the practice of the law. So I took a job in the uh, bank, the old uh, Oklahoma State Bank, which is now the Security National Bank. I started uh, in that bank at uh, I think $150 a month was uh, 
case here, and later vice president, and uh, uh, our employees at that time were having all the way from $60 to $75 a month, which was at that time a big salary. Uh, I recall of hiring in that bank uh, three employees who uh, served the bank uh, until now. Irving Beale, who recently passed away, was president of the bank. I hired him back in, uh, in 1927. Ralph Dix, who is still in the bank, I hired him in 1927, and he is still in the bank. And uh, salaries in those days were uh, not so good, but at the same time, the buying power of the dollar was a great deal more, and I'm not so sure but what they were better off than they are today with the big salaries and taxes. Uh, Mr. Prance, uh, since you are a graduate of the University of Oklahoma, uh, can you describe what were some of the student activities of those days? What was the most exciting thing that happened on campus while you were there? And uh, give us the, the date, uh, the years that you attended. At the time I uh, graduated uh, from high school in Oklahoma in 1913, uh, Oklahoma did not require uh, pre-law. Therefore, uh, I entered right into the law school in uh, 1914 and uh, graduated in 1917. Uh, it being a three-year uh, course and required no uh, pre-arts uh, and science. In those days, of course, the classes were much smaller than they uh, are at the present time, and I feel uh, that a youngster had a better chance of getting a better education as he was in more or less uh, closer contact with his professors and attended classes, uh, smaller classes, and uh, I, I really feel that their chances for education were better than they are now with the larger classes. Uh, during the years that I was in uh, school uh, was the time that Bud Wilkinson had the all-famous uh, football team that won national honors and uh, so many successive, so many successive uh, games, and uh, they also had a good uh, baseball team. athletics at the university uh, were about the same as they are now, and uh, they have always had uh, very good uh, good teams and good turnout there. When I graduated from the university and finished my uh, uh, term in uh, the Army, I came back and located in Enid, and uh, we had four children and 14 grandchildren, uh, all of whom uh, grew up in Enid, and uh, most of them attended uh, Oklahoma University or are attending there now, and uh, some have graduated. and. Uh, most of my immediate family are still living, all but one couple uh, in Enid, Oklahoma, which uh, is very fortunate for Mrs. France and me. Of 
because we do not know what Life magazine called us from New York and said that we had been selected as the ordinary family of America and they wanted to come down and photograph us and take our pictures and all. At that time we had uh, only three children and uh, no grandchildren, of course, and uh, they came down and spent three days taking pictures uh, and interviewing us for Life magazine. There was a one family, New York apartment family, one uh, medium family of the, in the West, and then one rural family. And the write-ups appeared in uh, 1948 in Life magazine. After this the article appeared in Life, we were uh, uh, we were contacted uh, by hundreds of people uh, by letter all over uh, the United States, uh, Frances, and people who were related to Frances, wanting to know if there was any connection of our family. I left the uh, Oklahoma State Bank uh, uh, in about 1927, at which time I uh, organized uh, an insurance agency and have uh, continued as head of that agency until just recently when I retired, turning the uh, agency over to my two boys and uh, their two sons who are now operating it in Enid. I watched uh, Enid uh, grow from a small community of uh, several hundred people to the present population of uh, around 45,000. Enid has not been a boom town. It has grown gradually. It has nothing particularly to uh, offer to make it a boom town. We do not have too much uh, industry, but uh, our uh, main claim is to a lot of fine people who have located here. I believe that we have more people in Enid with some money and uh, not uh, a lot of people with a lot of money, but I will venture to say that there are as many millionaires in Enid for the size of the town than any other place that I know of. Uh, Mr. France, uh, tell us about your leadership involvement uh, in some of the projects in, the, in and around Enid, the problems you had, and how you solved them. Well, I have not had any particular problems that I know of. I uh, have been uh, a stockholder and helped to build several uh, projects in Enid, particularly the Banfield Brothers Packing Company here, from which I was a director and stockholder for a number of years, which uh, uh, I feel should have been here today had not uh, it been for the fact that uh, the uh, Managers for that kind of business were not available, and uh, we decided to uh, sell the plant, and uh, which was done about five or six years ago. Mr. France, uh, what was the most exciting thing which happened? in your job, in your community, in your activities during the early days following college? 
Well, I can't recall for the moment any particular thing that happened. Uh, I might mention that uh, we had a rotary meeting at Fairview uh, one night, and uh, there was a call came in that the Garfield County Courthouse was on fire and burning to the ground. Well, that interrupted our meeting, and uh, most of us left and came to town, and the courthouse did, in fact, uh, burn to the ground. However, most of the records uh, which were in the vault were preserved, and uh, we were able to uh, continue. Incidentally, one of the uh, big uh, controversies and fights they had in Enid in the early days was over the uh, uh, square. They closed the uh, Broadway, uh, and uh, it was not open for a number of years. And uh, finally, the businessmen downtown wanted it open, and uh, brought on a fight to uh, get it open, which it was eventually done, and we feel it has been very beneficial to the town to have it open. The downtown property owners and uh, merchants uh, have been very much concerned uh, the past few years over the uh, businesses moving away and uh, out to the uh, outlying districts due to the fact that uh, there was a shortage of parking. Now the downtown merchants have uh, awakened to the fact that uh, they're going to have to do something about it and have done so. Uh, many buildings have been uh, torn down and parking uh, made available and uh, there's a movement on at the present time for a new civic center downtown, which uh, I think will become a reality for many years. Property values uh, have uh, slowly increased in value for the uh, past many years until now it's uh, come to the point where uh, the uh, ground or property is worth more than the building. <coughs> Speaking of uh, real estate and uh, business properties around the square, I can recall as a youngster when about uh, every third store in Enid was a saloon. And uh, a lot of the uh, churches coming into Enid uh, uh, occupied the saloons on Sunday as a meeting place. Uh, Mr. Prance, what do you consider uh, the greatest improvement and industry-wise and otherwise, that has been made in Enid uh, in the last few years. Well, as, a, as I said before, uh, Enid is an, uh, an agricultural uh, community. We don't have too much industry, but uh, the principal uh, things that we have here, and one of the most uh, vital is the Phillips University, Vance Air Force Base, Champlin Refining Company, and the wheat elevators that have been built uh, in and around Enid. I think that uh, uh, perhaps Vance Air Force Base is uh, uh, the most beneficial to Enid and business in this community than anything that uh, we have here, and I'd sure hate to see it moved away. 
Phillips University, of course, is uh, a great benefit to Enid uh, in many ways. <coughs> I've felt for a long time that uh, somebody is uh, not only going to make uh, a million dollars, but uh, they're going to do a, a great, uh, be a great benefit to uh, the entire universe if they would find some manner of uh, getting rid of the stockpile of old cars. Well, certainly there is going to be uh, some use for them and uh, to devise a means to uh, collect them, transport them someplace to where they could be put into some use would uh, be a great uh, thing. I also think that somebody is going to uh, make a lot of money by putting in a foundry down in this country someplace. They ship all this uh, junk and uh, material east and it's uh, made into steel and then they ship it back and sell it in Oklahoma whereby if there was a foundry or manufacturing place here that uh, could handle that uh, material locally, uh, they could make a lot of money out of it. Mr. France, uh, what do you feel is the greatest difference between Enid today and the time of World War I? Oh, at the time of World War I, uh, Enid was a very small uh, community. I think we had uh, uh, possibly 10, 11, 12,000 people here at that time, and more or less a country town, and it still is more or less a country town. Uh, the nice part about Enid is that uh, wonderful place to raise a family. Uh, we don't have any trouble here of any time. I've never had any uh, trouble with the Negroes or black people. We have a very fine uh, black population here, not too many, but we've always gotten along. And speaking of integration, I can remember in my first grade uh, in Wellington, Kansas, at that time, uh, there was a class of about uh, 25 or 30 students, and eight or 10 of them were colored. That was uh, back in 1900. And uh, I feel that uh, there's no trouble in integration. There should not be an in integration now. As a fact, I think it's been a, a failure. Uh, the Negroes don't want to go to white schools, and white people don't want to go to Negro schools. They just let them alone and seek their own level and provide them uh, good teachers and good schools. Why, we'd be a lot better off than trying to force them or bus them together. One thing about living in a town the size of Enid is that um, you can uh, reach uh, your business from your house in about three or four minutes. You can go to the country club in three or four minutes. You can uh, go to the country or across town uh, in three or four minutes, and uh, whereas in the city it just takes you forever to get anywhere. And I think it's a wonderful place to live. Uh, Mr. France, uh, what do you predict for the future of Enid? Well, uh, I think that uh, Enid has a great future. I don't think that there will ever be, a, at least for a good many years, a big city because there's nothing to uh, bring people to Enid. Uh, we don't have very much manufacturing. There's uh, uh, no opportunity for people to get jobs here much. And I think that 
that uh, Enid will always be a good, solid town, uh, but will never be, a, uh, as far as I'm concerned, a big town. This is uh, James Cadigan interviewing Dr. Wilfred E. Powell. Dr. Powell is associated with Phillips University in Enid, Oklahoma. On this date, May the 20th, 1970, we're giving you this interview from the First uh, Methodist Church in the city of uh, Oklahoma. First Methodist Church in Enid, Oklahoma. Uh, Dr. Powell was a Founders Day speaker at the Phillips University on October the 9th, 1958. Dr. Powell, tell us about your place of birth and parents. Well, I was born on the other side of the world in the small country of New Zealand. My hometown and birthplace and where I lived for the first 22 years of my life was the southernmost city of New Zealand, Dunedin, a settlement early made by Scotch uh, settlers in New Zealand. There I grew up. My father was born in Australia, my mother in England, and went to New Zealand when she was 14 years old. And I lived in Dunedin for my childhood and youth. It was a city then of about 60,000. Uh, we lived in the suburbs. There were hills all around the harbor. We had a very wholesome and pleasant life. And uh, in 1915, after I had attended the Otago Boys High School there and had gone to a good many night classes, I was interested in coming to America to continue some education for the Christian ministry. On that on year, on August the 31st, I left the Naden and was in the company of another student friend and uh, an older friend who was a minister. We journeyed to the United States, stopping in Hawaii on the way, and I arrived at Enid, Oklahoma about uh, 10 o'clock in the evening on a Rock Island train on October the 9th, 1915. And there I was met by a group of Phillips students and taken to a rooming place out at the Phillips campus. And there my whole adult life, my further education and my love for Phillips, which brought me back after my graduate work, there it began. You want to start Dr. Powell, uh, can you remember any special events which occurred in New Zealand during your boyhood? Tell us of the approximate year, if you can remember. Also, just tell us about your schools. Describe your schools at that time. I went uh, to a suburban school, the Cavisham School, out on the edge of the city. 
where we had uh, two years of uh, the infant room and then began the first standard up to the sixth standard. Those two put together correspond roughly to the eight grades as in schools here. We had uh, typical British background teachers, men teachers in some of the early grades even. And uh, uh, I was, a, I suppose, an average student, but I had some special interests. I used to decorate my papers with artwork. During my childhood, and I can't remember the year, we could check it, <laughs> but it was during the Boer War in South Africa. Uh, the New Zealanders celebrated a famous victory of Sir Robert General Baden Powell, the vif victory of Mafeking. And one thing I do remember about that is that we had a holiday and I was hoisted on the shoulders of the students and ever after that my nickname was Baden. And it, if I was to go back there and visit with some of those old timers, they'd probably call me that now. Then I went, as I said, to the Otago Boys High School for two years. And uh, in those days, uh, there was very, not nearly as many people went to high school as they do now. After two years, you could pass an examination and go on for another two, but I chose to go to work, and I worked in an office for the years between then and the time of my leaving. But I became interested in the church and in preaching, and it was because of that interest that I was influenced by a very dear friend to come to America. I remember being very scared about it, wondering how on earth it would be and whether I'd be accepted, and, uh, dreaming of being lonely and all that kind of thing, and life didn't turn out that way at all. I've been welcomed here and have enjoyed every minute of it from the first day. Dr. Powell, when you arrived in Enid, can you give us uh, some of the details? Can you describe or tell us the ones that you might remember who were community leaders in the city of Enid while you were growing up, and also uh, uh, tell us uh, about your experiences at uh, the Phillips University and uh, how you came along in the growing up period there, Doctor. All right. <laughs> <laughs> when I arrived at uh, the station that night, I was met by this group of students, one of whom was uh, a man by the name of Oswald Golter, who had come the previous year from Australia. And our friendship developed from that moment and has lasted through all the years since. To jump ahead, one of my retirement projects has been writing a biography of Dr. and Mrs. Golter telling of their 30 years of missionary endeavor in China in those troubled years from 1922 to 1951. And that book uh, has been published by Phillips and is awakening a good deal of interest. But to go back, when I uh, got my, one of my early automobile rides that night, for there was someone there with one of the few cars <laughs> who drove us out to the university, and I remember very distinctly my first impression in the moonlight of the three stark red brick buildings rising up over the prairie and wondering what they had of my future in them. I soon found out. <laughs> I was first classified as a sub-freshman, and I graduated the first year from the Phillips High School, <laughs> which has long been out of existence. <laughs> then I was able to catch up in the summertime and graduated 
with the class of 1919. During those years, of course, Dr. Zollers, the first president, had died, and Dr. McCash, the second president, had begun his administration uh, during my first year, 1516. Uh, there were other, there were many faculty members that uh, gave tremendous assistance to their students in the general arts college. We think of Roy J. Wolfinger or Frank A. Wellman and many others. And in the Bible college where I was enrolled, C.C. Taylor, Frank H. Marshall, the dean, and uh, very influential in my life, Dr. Harry D. Smith, who is remembered by students still very dearly. Uh, Dr. Powell, tell us about your leadership involvement with the Phillips University and about the problems you had and how you solved them. Uh, what was the most exciting thing which happened in your, your community and your activity with Phillips during your early days uh, with the Phillips University? Well, there were many. Perhaps I should say that I got married in 1917 and met my wife of nearly nearly 40 years on the campus in student activities there were many also i was a member of the intercollegiate debate teams and in those days a debate had a very high degree of student support and enthusiasm and I have very real recollections of some of the debates when we happened to win, of being carried on the shoulders of the students and the band playing and the celebration, something like you have now for football games. In my senior year, I was uh, editor of the student paper. And that was the year 1819. And there were many events that year, of course. The war was on. Uh, but uh, Armistice Day came in November. Students who had been involved in the war were returning before that year was over. And all of these events were headlined in the newspaper uh, of the college, which at that time was called the Slate. I asked some of the alumni uh, representatives that uh, were back on the campus this morning. How many of them knew what the slate was? Well, of course, the old timers did. The present and the recent graduates know the school paper as the haymaker. Uh, One of our regular activities was our weekend student preaching appointments. And early in my first year, I had my first experience at a little place that is now hardly on the map, but at that time was a thriving little village called Quay, Oklahoma, about three miles north of where Yale is now. The church I served there could only afford preaching once every two weeks, and the remuneration was small, but it helped mightily in those days. And we used to go out, a bunch of us, walking across the fields uh, from East Enid north to the Frisco tracks where there was a sign labeled Steen, S-T-E-E-N. And there the Frisco coming out from the downtown station would stop and pick us up and take us to our various places east. Uh, I used to get off the Frisco at Pawnee and wonder about the Indians that I saw there in the afternoons as I waited for my train to go down to Quay in the evening. 
Many students did this kind of thing. And it was both a valuable experience for the young hope-to-be minister and also, even though the remuneration was quite small, was a great assistance in their paying their expenses in college. The last three years of my undergraduate work, I was minister of the Christian Church at Medford in Grant County. Uh, Dr. Powell, describe for us about your experiences in your college work at Yale University. My work at Yale, of course, was first in the Yale Divinity School, where in those days, they allowed us a full year of credit toward the divinity degree because we had taken Bible and other religious courses as undergraduates at Phillips. They don't do that anymore. So I received my BD degree in two years. It was a very, very enriching experience. Dean Charles Reynolds Brown, quite well known throughout the world, was the dean at that time. My major professor was Luther Allen Weigel, who for years has been a leader in interdenominational work, has been the chairman of the Standard Bible Committee, uh, the Revised Standard Version Committee, and is a well-known figure. I was very hesitant at first, but managed to get along very well. And one of the things that contributed to my life greatly was that here, since this was a school attended by students of many different denominations, to have fellowship and understanding with them greatly enriched my life. I got my B.D. in 21, stayed for another year of graduate work, getting my M.A. in the graduate school in 1922, and then had the call to come back to the campus at Phillips and launch a new department, the new department at that time of religious education, as it was called then. I started my teaching in 1922, but I went back to Yale twice, 1925-26 and 1928-29, when I received my doctor's degree there. Uh, Dr. Powell, what do you consider some of the most unusual experiences in this period? Well, I began my teaching in 1922 at that time, what we called religious education was a relatively new field and was being tremendously emphasized in all the churches. It was the year that the International Council of Religi Religious Education was organized. And there were many projects, uh, leadership training schools, some of which went on for many, many years regularly. and. Uh, in the first year of my teaching, uh, we had a committee of ministers and organized the setup of a course in the Bible taught at the Enid High School on a new basis, not to be taught in the school buildings because we were recognizing the separation of church and state. So the organization built a little building out uh, near next across the street uh, east from the high school and Professor Shane who had previously taught at Phillips became the first teacher of this Enid High School Bible course it was taught in this little building he taught it for 23 years under all kinds of difficult circumstances uh, 
because the depression came on and made the project very difficult that the courses in Bible were taught one interesting thing happened <laughs> the lot on which the building was erected was sold and we had to move the building out into the street with no place to go then later it was moved to the west side of the high school but continued to be the place of teaching this course and then it was moved south and more recently a church building across the street has been purchased and is now the site where the Bible course at Eden High School is taught. We had many problems with the Depression. I remember very well. We organized the salary schedule committee uh, and we secured the approval by the Board of Trustees of a salary schedule on 1928. That year I went away from my graduate work. And soon after I came back, the Depression had hit and the salary schedule had to be thrust aside for the time being. It was never repudiated, and it was revived later on. Our salaries were often not paid. There were many ingenious devices created. Prof Professor Shirley uh, needed uh, some dental work done, but he couldn't pay the dentist. The dentist had a daughter he wanted to send to college, but he was doubtful about paying the tuition. The school had sal faculty without salaries, but by uh, pure bookwork, by crediting something to the salaries, uh, by uh, giving the student his tuition, by arranging it with the dentist. Everybody was taken care of without any money actually passing at all. Dr. Powell, uh, could you relate uh, uh, some of the more recent improvements that have been made at Phillips? Well, of course, recent uh, <laughs> means various things, but uh, let me go back just a little bit. Of course, through the very basic administration of Dr. McCash, the effects of the Depression were felt almost all the way through. It was almost impossible for buildings to be built. In Dr. Briggs' administration, he was dedicated to changing this. And uh, in 1947, a fire destroyed the old historic old main building, the center of the Phillips campus. And that necessitated uh, the uh, a vigorous building program. When that fire occurred, the Marshall Bible Building, the largest, the impressive Gothic building on the campus, the basement had just been dug and it was not until 1950 that that building was completed and was used for many of the departments and classes because Old Main had been destroyed by fire. At the same time, a science building was built. In that Marshall building, uh, the, in the chapel and some of the other rooms, uh, the series of stained glass windows that have been visited and viewed by people from many places year after year. I had a, an opportunity to share in the planning of those windows, and that would be one of the very satisfying things so far as I am personally concerned. There's one small window, to just mention one, that has some connection with Oklahoma dates, a small window that has a panel for each of the dates 1889, 1893, and 1907. Each of them connected with our state's development and each of them connected with Phillips. In 1889, it shows one of our early evangelists in a baptismal service in Oklahoma City. At the time, 
of the early settlement there. In 1893, it shows Mr. Bogus riding horseback into the Cherokee Strip territory and establishing churches there. In 1907, it shows the first buildings of Phillips being built and the students coming and sitting on nail kegs and other crude seating arrangements because the building wasn't quite completed. These three dates link Oklahoma history and Phillips history in one panel. Uh, Dr. Powell, what do you predict uh, for the future of Phillips University and Enid, Oklahoma? Well, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet, but I have very deep feelings of confidence both in the community of Enid and in the school where I have spent so many of my years in service. There are problems, of course. Every educational institution has them these days, and especially a private institution supported largely by the churches. But Phillips is doing some of the most significant things it ever has done now, and Enid is growing not as rapidly, perhaps, as some would like, but solidly in every area. I've lived here, I've only lived at three places in all my life, in Connecticut, in New Zealand, and in Enid, Oklahoma. And if I had to choose again, I think I would make the same decision and come to Enid, Oklahoma. Well, thank you, Doctor. We have just completed a most delightful interview with Dr. Wilfred E. Powell of the Phillips University in Enid. This is James Cadigan, your interviewer, uh, speaking from Enid, Oklahoma. <laughs>